Good afternoon. Welcome to the second International Governance Series lecture of this academic year. We are especially fortunate to have with us none other than Professor John Waters, who holds the Chair in Global Governance at the University of Lorraine in Belgium, who is also directs the Center for Global Governance Studies in the Institute for International Law. He is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe and chairman of the Strategic Advisory Council on International Affairs of the Flemish Government. And practices law at Linklater's in Brussels and is the editor of the International Encyclopedia of Inter Intergovernmental Organizations, has a long list of publications including many books to his record, including one on the United Nations and the European Union. In his spare time he jogs, he tells me. I don't know what spare time he would have. <laughs> uh, here at CG and the Balsili School we have paid special attention to the role of emerging powers and of course to the G20, which has been one of the, our key policy platforms. But it will be argued that a lot is happening in Europe on the global governance front. And Belgium and the University of Leuven are, of course, at the very core of that action. Uh, we were talking with Professor Waters uh, last evening and also earlier today uh, about uh, how important it is for students that are interested in issues of global governance and regional governance to actually see it in action as opposed to just read about it in, in books. And obviously, uh, the University of Leuven and uh, Belgium is at the very core of uh, the, the EU. And you know, um, for those of you who would be interested in the possibility of spending some time there, uh, actually seeing the uh, famous Eurocrats uh, doing their shenanigans, uh, I think it would be a very uh, good and enlightening uh, experience. Um, to see with Anne, first time what it takes to run to run Europe. Not not an easy task in general terms. Uh, I would say particularly not an easy task these days. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the president of the European Council, uh, not the president of Europe. There is no such thing yet. There may be in the future. Is a former Belgian uh, prime minister, Herman Fine Rompuy, uh, who is in the middle of the action, as it were. That said, for quite some time now, it has been argued that Europe is much too concerned with its own problems to be able to really focus on global issues. This week, we're witnessing essentially the dismantling of much of the foreign policy and defense apparatus of the United Kingdom, what used to be known as the British Empire, uh, will have seen better days. Uh, you cannot dismiss half a million public employees without causing some effect on your capacity to deal with the world, and that is what we are seeing. I mean, this is really something of a remarkable uh, magnitude and, and, and size. I, I haven't seen something like that for a very long time. Um, some say this may be a harbinger of things to come elsewhere in, in Europe. I, for one, am thus especially keen to hear what Professor Waters has to say on the subject of the EU and global governance, which is the way forward, and what we can expect from the EU on some of the critical global challenges facing the international community. Without further ado, I leave with you Professor John Waters. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. <laughs> as I only learned this morning that you have been ambassador in quite important places. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here in CG in Waterloo. It's my very first visit, not just to Waterloo, but also to Canada. And um, uh, I, I, I really feel like uh, this is a beautiful and a wonderful country that we in Belgium could learn a great deal of things about, because we in Belgium have also a little bit our own kind of uh, problems for the moment, political problems, f forming a new government, and so on. And in a country like Canada, there are obviously other types of interesting linguistic uh, 
uh, arrangements and so on that we, uh, I think, in Europe could could learn and benefit from. So we could we should get to know each other much better. And in any event, for this group, I can already say you will be very welcome if you ever come to Brussels or Leuven. We're only like 15 minutes away from Brussels, and um, I can assure you, Leuven is a great town with lots of nice things to offer to students. We'll talk about the European Union as a global actor after the Lisbon Treaty. And um, I mean, this is an open-ended kind of question, of course. I will not have a an, an definitive type of answer. Not just because it's so broad, but also because the story is unfolding every day. The Lisbon Treaty entered into force on the 1st of December last year, so less than a year ago, and it has brought about quite a number of important changes, but many of the institutional ramifications still will have to be felt because lots of the things are still in process of being implemented, and I will tell you about that. But let me start off with, as a kind of introductory question, the question, now, what's really new? Wasn't the European Union already a global actor before this treaty entered into force? Indeed, the European Union has been with us well, strictly speaking, only since 1993, when the Maastricht Treaty entered into force. But as you know, the European integration process has been far uh, older, and in, in fact started the early 1950s with the setting up of the so-called European Coal and Steel Treaty, the so-called Paris Treaty. So in the, in, in the course of like 60 years of European integration, we have seen a great number of things happening internally in Europe. We have set up um, a common market, later on a single market or inter internal market, but it's basically the same. It's about internal economic integration, free movement of persons, peoples, um, of capital, services, uh, goods, and a customs union, obviously. And on that basis, which we established already in the 1960s, we continued to deepen the integration process with the big kind of uh, next steps being the economic and monetary union, the EMU, the single currency, that was introduced uh, 11 years ago, with also the political unification process being very important ever after German reunification, leading to the Maastricht Treaty, where we created a kind of overall umbrella structure for the European integration process, the European Union. And so I'll, I'll speak about the European Union and how it looks like after the Lisbon Treaty um, uh, in a few moments. But let me just first say, already before this new Lisbon Treaty entered into force, the EU was doing a lot of things uh, internationally. Trade, it's actually the world's first trade power. Whether you like to um, acknowledge it or not, it is indeed the biggest trading bloc in the world. 500 million uh, people, lots of, uh, say, exports, imports, always been uh, a very powerful actor within the GATT and nowadays in the WTO. Always been in that area what we call an area of exclusive competences, so the European Commission being really effectively the voice, the single voice of Europe in the whole multilateral trade arena. So if you go and visit the WTO in Geneva, you will be astonished to see that there is this whole room with all those delegates and that the 27 delegates of the EU member states will simply sit there and never speak up an incredible discipline for uh, diplomats, as you can imagine. But the only person that speaks up on behalf of the entire European Union is the Commission representative, is the European Commission. And that, of course, means that they coordinate ex ante their positions and what have you. But you, you do really have there, I think, a rather interesting illustration of the external dimension of European unification, namely the EU acting with one voice on the world stage. But that's in the trade area. We have in the financial area, as I said, we have the euro over the last 11 years. It's been a great success story. It's nowadays already the world's second reserve currency. I think it will continue to uh, grow in importance. As you realize and remember from the beginning of this year, we've gone through a number of turbulent uh, moments. The Greek uh, currency uh, crisis, uh, the Greek uh, uh, crisis and the, the speculations that uh, went together with it. But we have survived. And I think what is happening right now is that um, the system is deepening and is adjusting to the challenges. There's now an enormous interesting work going on about economic governance and stricter financial budget 
budgetary disciplines vis-à-vis uh, -vis national governments, even with, uh, say, a sanction uh, system that is going to be um, uh, implemented. But this is a unique thing, you know, a single currency, a currency without a state. Uh, for in, in international relations terms, uh, a, a currency is really something that is very strongly linked to the notion of a nation state. In Europe, as a kind of, I think, really achievement of this post-World War um, uh, integration process, we have come to the stage that we have a single currency, but without it responding or corresponding to a nation state. It's not linked to a nation state. Look at the euro coins and the euro notes. You will not find a head of state on it. Well, on the coins, yes, because there has been a compromise in which the, the back side of the coin could still have the national kinds of uh, uh, illustrations, and you will see indeed uh, it's, it's nice also as a collector's item. You have all those euro coins depending on the country you're in, even on one of Vatican City nowadays. But but the notes, as you may uh, recall, are all just you know architectural design styles. Uh, Literally, um, not real places because one didn't want to attach it to any capital or to any real historical site, but it's the styles of European like uh, architectural um, uh, history. And in that sense, it really shows also physically on the notes how detached this is from the, from the symbols of a nation state. Uh, it, it's really something quite remarkable. But I mean, that currency area is becoming more and more important not just internally as a beacon of stability, but also externally. The only problem, and I will come back to it during my talk, is that we haven't yet reached the stage in which there has been this kind of, I would say, external um, consequential step to be taken, namely that within the global financial institutions, we also are replacing the individual member states with a kind of Eurozone uh, representation. If we look at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the EU member states have just continued to act as if they still had their own currency. They're still sitting there, but singly, as individual states. And I think that's an anomaly that we have to repair um, as soon as possible. Development and humanitarian aid. You may not know it, but the EU is the world's biggest donor. 65% of official development aid comes from the EU plus its member states. 65%. Humanitarian aid, more or less uh, similar figures. Security, which for a long time in the European integration process has been a taboo subject because of some rather unhappy um, things that, uh, that, that took place in the, the French Assemblée Nationale in 1954, when the project for a European defense community was basically torpedoed um, over there but you know now nowadays after the especially since the Kosovo intervention of NATO in 99 we see a real emerging European Union security and even defense policy taking place there have been uh, more than 26 crisis management operations already in four different continents I will not say that these are the most bold and ambitious projects it's definitely not comparable to to the UN's record in terms of peacekeeping operation, but it is something, and it shows that over the last, say, 10 years, Europe, also in the security area, has developed an interesting operational capacity that didn't exist before. Climate change, Europe has always prided itself of being the leader in terms of climate change policies. It was also, as you can imagine, not very difficult to be the leader in a situation of, a, say, a Bush administration that absolutely was not interested in the whole issue. Uh, I, I will not dare to say anything about Canadian policies in this area, but in any event, in the EU, they did their homework, and they did it rather, I would say, um, systematically. They have still the internal legislation ready, the post-Kyoto implementing legislation. There is a detailed plan for um, the lowering of emission, of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, 20% by 2020, with even a commitment to make even deeper cuts, 30%, depending on whether other third countries and emerging uh, powers are willing to also commit, commit themselves to a post-Kyoto arrangement. But this also brings us to a 
paradox, because I do not know if you recall the Copenhagen summit in December last year, which has been a deeply traumatizing event for the European Union, because they had done their homework, they had made all those in impressive commitments in terms of internal implementation, in terms of committing themselves to financing uh, developing countries and so on. And then comes the Copenhagen summit and what happens? Nothing happens, a whole well, like two weeks that everybody is walking around. But in the very end you have a little room where Obama is sitting together with well, the Indians, the Chinese, the Brazilians, but not with the Europeans. The Europeans were outside of the room where this notorious Copenhagen Accord was uh, negotiated. So they only had to, in a way, pre they were presented with the results of that, but they, in spite of all the preparatory work that had gone into it, they weren't really part of the deal-making process. That has been, I think, a rather traumatizing uh, event, and it shows us something about the current state of uh, European leadership, and I think also the problem of representation of Europe. Because one of the things that has been said afterwards, after the Copenhagen summit, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but one of the remarks was, you know, it was simply impractical. There were too many European leaders around to be taken into that small room. And that is maybe true. You had the president of the commission there, you had all those director generals, you had, you had uh, Sarkozy walking around, you had Merkel walking around, you had obviously the Swedish presidency and so on. Too many Europeans in the room. And that is one of the things that continues, I, I'm afraid, to agonize us and to chase us a little bit also after the Lisbon Treaty. Last but not least, the European Union for more than a decade has established, um, I would say, ever deepening and broadening relationship with the United Nations. There is a bit of a remarkable commitment, both in policy terms and nowadays with the Lisbon Treaty, in binding treaty terms, that the European Union believes that uh, in order to tackle global problems, one should follow the multilateral route. It's a real strong commitment to multilateralism, in particular in the context of the United Nations. That is what the Lisbon Treaty says, really binding treaty law nowadays. So the EU has been working together with the United Nations, as the ambassador said, we have published a book about this process. And that's a fascinating ongoing story, because in a way it links the global to the regional. It links indeed the global organization with all of its problems and, say, shortcomings, deficiencies, but in any event a very different organizational culture. It links it to the European Union with its own culture, with its own kind of special, um, say, characteristics, the Commission, the Council, the European Parliament and what have you. But it's an interesting kind of thing. And when you look at the the various areas of international policy making that the EU has become engaged in, it's always also linked to the UN. There's always the, the idea that one operates under at least some form of um, kind of uh, umbrella or uh, with some form of blessing of the United Nations, be it peace operations with a mandate from the Security Council, be it at UN patronized events uh, in the various UN uh, capitals and so on. Now, just to say, in fact, the EU was already already active at the international plane. So what is new with this Lisbon Treaty? I have two quotes for you, uh, one from Lady Ashton, or Baroness Ashton. Catherine Ashton has become the EU's high representative on foreign affairs and security policy. She was uh, appointed uh, last year in November, um, and she is playing a very important role in the whole Lisbon kind of uh, scenario, because as we will see, her mandate, her function is a quite comprehensive one. She has in fact the so-called triple-hatted function. I will explain that a bit in more details. But she, in, in the context of that function, she goes to many places, including the Security Council. And in May of this year, before the United Nations Security Council, she made this statement saying, look, the Lisbon Treaty offers the opportunity to strengthen the EU's international impact and strategic vision through streamlined decision making and greater policy coherence and consistency. So what, in fact, um, transpires from this um, statement is that, you know, uh, the Lisbon Treaty helps us to become a more effective, um, uh, say, coherent, consistent international actor. 
that the question is, is that really true? Is that really the case? We will see in the next, uh, say, minutes. Then we have Mr. Barroso, um, um, Jose Manuel Barroso, our European Commission president. Mr. Barroso um, also likes to appear on the international scene. And he was, uh, a, a month ago, he was um, visiting New York, as basically half of the European Commission does in the so-called high-level segment of the General Assembly. And he gave a talk at Columbia University in a World Leaders Forum. And he had this remark, saying that the Lisbon Treaty gives us ways to act more efficiently, efficiently inside Europe and means to defend Europe's interests on the world stage. So apparently there is something that has changed and that should should make Europe more effective, consistent as an international player. So if you allow me, and I, in that sense I can really not hide my legal background, I'm always interested to read what is in that new treaty. I have friends and colleagues with political science who tell their students, you should never believe what is in a treaty. And that's a very interesting type of statement because, indeed, treaties sometimes do not tell you what is the real practice about. But especially when there is a new treaty that has just entered into force, it is maybe still interesting to look into the text of the treaty. And there are a couple of things that are noteworthy in terms of this international actorness. In the past, and I'm not going to try to explain it in full detail, in the past we had a horribly complicated setup in which you basically had three international organizations plus the EU. You had the European communities, three European communities, with their own international legal personality and their own treaty-making capacity. The most important one of which was the European community, the so-called Rome Treaty. Now, can you imagine that you have to explain to people in the UN or bilaterally third countries, look, there's a difference between the European community and the European Union. Everybody will ask you, well, what's the difference? Well, the thing was the European community had its own legal personality, had its own division of tasks between the institutions, could make its own treaties and so on, whereas the European Union, which exists since the Maastricht Treaty 13, uh, 17 years ago, the European Union was not supposed to be an international legal person itself. Try to explain that, especially to non-lawyers, but also to people from outside Europe. It's a horrible story. So everybody got mixed up, say EC, EU, and then the European Commission, what is it doing, and so on and so forth. The, Euro the Lisbon Treaty, if anything, has simplified this picture because the European community disappears. The EC doesn't exist anymore. It's being replaced and succeeded by the European Union. So simplification, we just say EU. Little footnote, as a lawyer, I love footnotes. There is still one remaining community out there. I mean, the, the coal and steel community has uh, elapsed in 2002. The European community is now succeeded by the Lisbon Treaty and by the EU. But there is still the so-called European Atomic Energy Community, Euratom, which, consists, which continues to operate independently. So, I mean, the complete clarification and simplification is not yet with us. But the overall picture is you now have one EU, one EU which explicitly is given legal personality. Now you may ask yourself a question, what the heck legal personality? Is that so important? In fact it is, because if you really want to engage into international diplomacy, into international treaty making, into involvement in international organizations without that legal personality, there's not that much you can do. You need to be able to be not just a diplomatic or political actor, but also a legal actor, especially the European Union, which, say, as part of its own internal integration process, has developed a full-fledged legal system, a legal order, the European Union legal order. And for the EU, it's, as we uh, will see, it's very important to be able to act also as a treaty actor, because it likes to follow this kind of binding approach, binding states, um, international organizations, bringing them into legally enforceable uh, obligations. You could say it's a, maybe a bit of a legalistic approach that the European Union people follow in their international relations. Yeah, it would be an interesting way of discussing it to see that 
let's say some big powers, the ones who are maybe really big and really influential, do not always like to have legally binding um, uh, commitments. Sometimes even prefer just politically loose type of arrangements which offer more flexibility. But the EU prefers to have those more legally binding, um, uh, say, engagements. Then, what is very interesting about the Lisbon Treaty, and usually I have some slides that really display those detailed provisions, but I simply refer to it. There is no organization or country in the world that has such a long, detailed list of foreign relations objectives. You cannot imagine. I mean, those treaty articles, Article 3 and 21 of the EU treaty, really give you such a list of all the objectives of EU foreign relations. It goes from the respect of human rights and democracy and rule of law till sustainable uh, trade, uh, fair trade, the rights of the child, respect for international law, um, the sustained development of the earth, what have you. It's a very long list and the interesting thing with Lisbon, that's again a macro of this kind of um, consolidation exercise, these foreign policy objectives now apply across the board. So it now applies in all of the external policies that the EU does, be it in trade, be it in development, humanitarian, be it in security, uh, environment, what have you, areas. You could say, what the heck? Well, the important thing is, until now, the European Union was a bit of a fragmented actor. Depending on the policy area, for instance trade, it was just about trade. It was like uh, negotiating free trade arrangements or regional arrangements with other countries, the Doha round in the WTO. The interesting thing of these new objectives, which are cross-cutting, is that, you know, for instance, the EU will be obliged by its own constitution to bring into the equation things such as human rights, development, um, democracy, rule of law. In other words, through its Lisbon Treaty, the EU is becoming basically an enormous kind of moral machinery required to bring to the international level in its international relations the kind of ideals and principles and basic values that has basically that have been at the basis of its own internal growth process. Call it a form of, you know, you are transplanting or extrapolating at the international level your own kind of internal identity. Again, from a political scientist point of view, this is a hugely interesting and intriguing kind of thing. You know, as an international actor, you're trying to assert or to find your own identity by extrapolating your own values to the international system. Hugely interesting. But the interesting thing is that this is really in the treaty, so they can simply not back away from it. So the European Parliament, when it goes to approve new trade treaties of the European Union, will have the veto power and will be able to say, well, that new uh, free trade agreement agreement with uh, Korea is interesting, but you don't mention human rights. What about that? So, I mean, uh, in a certain way, it will lead to other interests, other values coming up, uh, the foreign relations um, the situation of the European Union. It will also lead to difficult discussions. I mean, you may be able to negotiate a free trade agreement with India or with China, but do you think the Indians or the Chinese will simply accept that you bring in a strong human rights clause? You can do that with, say, quite a number of developing countries, especially the so-called ACP countries, uh, that basically the former colonies of EU member states, where indeed the EU is able to more or less impose anything it wants in terms of a human rights clause, uh, a good governance clause, a clause in favoring the International Criminal Court, a clause against the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and so on. But you know, if the bargaining power of the other side is a bit bigger than that, it's maybe more difficult to impose all those values-based things um, to your partner. So that, that will be interesting to see how this will um, evolve in the future. New actors, new um, bodies, new forms of uh, entities to take care of a stronger international relations-based European Union. I mentioned already Lady Ashton, Catherine Ashton, as the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. I mentioned that she has a triple-hatted function. Now, you may recall how the first Secretary General of the United Nations, the Norwegian Trichferli, 
once upon a time remarked that the job of United Nations Secretary General is the most impossible job on earth. I would submit that the function description, the job description of Lady Ashton makes it the most impossible job in Europe. Why? Well, she has to be, on the one hand, she has to be in the European Commission, where she is vice president, has the portfolio of external relations, and has to coordinate all the external dimensions of internal policy making areas of the Commission, which is basically a great lot. That's the first function. Within the Commission, being there, attending weekly meetings, and what have you. Second function, she is chairing the Council of Ministers at least that format that deals with foreign affairs. So in institutional terms, and I admit that's going really into the nitty grit of the EU institutional setup, but the Commission is basically the institution that you know is the engine for European integration. So the Commission is what we call the real kind of independent place that reasons in the European interest, that comes up with new proposals for policy making in the European interest and so on. But the Council of Ministers ministers, that will also be chaired by Lady Ashton, the council is basically the place where the member states and national ministers come together. So that's really kind of, in terms of institutional uh, relationship, that's the place where the national interests come together. And that's a completely different set of uh, mindset than the European Commission. She has to chair that. So, I mean, it's, it's quite already going to be a bit of a balancing act to make sure that well, she, she uses the, the right hat, because uh, if you're the European Commission, you always have to plead in favor of the general European interest, whereas in the Council it's all about you know, uh, reconciling national interest. So that's already a big challenge. And then third, if that were not enough, she has a third hat, which is she is conducting the CFSP, the Common Foreign and Security Policy of the European Union. What does that mean, conducting that policy? It basically means she has to prepare all meetings of the Council, she has to follow up, she has to implement, she has to be at European Council, heads of state and government meetings, she has to conduct political dialogues with third countries, and there are lots of third countries with which the EU conducts political dialogues. She she has to fly to New York to represent European positions within the Security Council. In other words, just add those three functions together, it is an incredibly difficult and challenging type of function. You may ask yourself the question, why did they create such an impossible job? The main motivation was uh, you may recall the critique of Henry Kissinger when I have to dial Europe, what number do I call? Well, that was the idea. We, we create a Mr. or Mrs. Europe, one single phone number. She is going to be basically the EU's Minister of Foreign Affairs, the counterpart of the Secretary of State here and, and there. And so that was the idea. But in order to assure that there would be not just this single person, but also um, that she would be backed up by the right administration, they made her both, they gave her place within the Commission and in the Council. So in order to have a kind of call it personal union, uh, to bridge the gaps between those institutions, also to make things more coherent and more efficient. The interesting thing is that we risk to have neither of these. I mean, and that she, her, her life is so impossible that we will have maybe more coherence, but little action. Okay, that's another point, and we'll, we'll come back to that. She will be supported by a full-fledged European diplomatic service, the so-called European External Action Service. Now, this is really very new, and this is, in a way, very spectacular. You cannot imagine where we come from in Europe, but basically our member states still have this feeling like, you know, we are in the EU, fine, but all of our international diplomatic and consular network remains a very national thing. So you have tens of thousands diplomats and consular staff working for individual member states in all those missions in third countries, at international organizations, and basically continuing to do exactly the same things, but split over 27 embassies, permanent missions, and so on. You can imagine what an enormous potential for, I would say, rationalization there is out there if you were to say, now let us maybe pull some of those resources and create a real European diplomacy. And that we do the things together at European level also in the external uh, diplomatic posts. That's the idea of the European Diplomatic Service. Now, 
that in Europe things are of course always difficult to implement. So we have seen for almost a year quite some uh, protracted negotiations about the actual setup of this European External Action Service. There is a council decision of the 26th of July of this year that is now being implemented. The idea and the ambition being that by 1st of January 2011 there will be a functioning European diplomatic service with a body, a central body called the Ministry in Brussels and the union delegations, around 160, around the world. Union delegations that will be basically the external posts of this European External Action Service. And the union delegations it's not just a brand new story. There I have to tell you that the Lisbon Treaty basically has, um, I would say, re-nominated, re-denominated re the existing Commission delegations into European Union delegations. The European Commission over the last 45 years has indeed established a kind of worldwide diplomatic network. But these were basically commission delegations at the UN in New York, Geneva, Nairobi, what have you, uh, in third countries. Quite a worldwide diplomatic network, which at the time only was responsible and under the command of the European Commission. But now it becomes a union delegation, really spanning the whole spectre of EU policies. And in that sense, not just be answerable anymore to the Commission, but to Lady Ashton in her multifaceted, multi-hatted dimensions. So Lady Ashton is on top of what will become a rather big bureaucracy, bringing in people from the RELICS family, the so-called External Relations Department of the European Commission, of the Council of Ministers Secretariat, and one-third of national diplomats. So you see really like a kind of melting pot, if you wish, of diplomatic cultures and of people working in various aspects of EU external relations, but which is going to be an incredible challenge to create what I would call a common diplomatic culture. It's an enormous challenge because, you know, diplomatic cultures between member states are very, very different. You see it in all possible ways, starting with the protocol to all kinds of substantive uh, issues and approaches. Now the idea is you create such one European diplomatic service. President of the European Council, in Europe we are about creating new jobs, especially for retired politicians. So we created an additional function, the permanent president of the European Council. What is this? Well, you know, the European Council, before the Lisbon Treaty, was not a real institution, it was a periodical gathering of heads of state and government. So the real top politicians, heads of state, you know, Sarkozy, heads of government, prime ministers from the whole European Union, coming together every four months to have a summit meeting and to discuss, you know, the main political arenas and then giving basically orders and impulses to the other European institutions. Yeah, you do this, you do that, and we see each other back in three or four months. Now this European Council itself, try to imagine this, the Sarkozy's and, and, and say, um, the Prime Ministers of uh, Angela Merkel, all together, they now form also an institution. The European Council has become a full-fledged institution, and the idea is that they needed a permanent chair. Not just a chair that rotated every six months, which was the case until the Lisbon Treaty, the so-called six-monthly rotating presidency by one particular country. Nowadays, you still have this rotating presidency. My own country, Belgium, currently has the presidency uh, of the Council. But in the European Council, they now have a permanent chair. Mr. Van Rompuy, which is the previous uh, Belgian Prime Minister, but he was elected in that same uh, long dinner night as in which they elected Lady Ashton to the job of High Representative. What's the mandate of this person, this President of the European Council? It cannot be compared to a national head of state, but the interesting thing is, as we will see, that he's more and more 
behaving as a kind of head of state. I'll come back to that in a moment. The, the mandate of this president of the European Council is basically, you know, uh, when you get all those difficult characters together, you forge a culture of consensus and compromise so that you can indeed uh, have a good kind of decision-making process internally. But the Lisbon Treaty has also given this person a kind of external role. There is indeed, for this president of the European Council, also some role in terms of external representation at his high political level. So he, it should be the person who shakes hands with Obama, uh, with uh, the Chinese president, bilateral summits, the high level segment of the UN General Assembly and so on. So there is also a bit of an external dimension to the office of this president of the European Council. You see, it's already becoming clear that the Lisbon Treaty has not just created one person with one phone number to be dialed in case uh, one needs to work together. There there's a multiplicity of actors, and that will also be a bit of a part of the problem of the implementation of the treaty. There are still a number of other things which I do not want to bore you too long with that. Um, the competence issue is one of the very, very important things in Europe. Now you, you wonder, what is that, the competence issue? You know, just try to see it for yourself. Member states, those 27 member states, have of course agreed to be a member state of the European Union, but there's nothing so difficult for a state as to realize that you have surrendered sovereignty. So there is indeed a pooling of sovereignty. There are a number of areas in which the EU has taken over from the member states, both internally and externally. But because this process was going on all the time and was creepingly extending EU powers, Brussels, as it is said, Brussels is taking this or that initiative, and was taking over powers from the member states, the Lisbon Treaty now has established a kind of catalog of competences. Catalog really saying this is competence of the European Union, this remains national. The idea being to clarify what is an EU power and what is an area that the member states continue to exercise their sovereignty. Now this is a very fine-tuned area with, say, decades of battles going on in Brussels, in Luxembourg, before the European Court of Justice, and so there are various kinds of competences. The so-called exclusive competences, the so-called shared competences, so-called uh, supporting competences. I will not bore you with all the niceties of these things, but there's one very important thing you need to know. Exclusive competences are the areas in which the, only the European Union can act. And I mentioned to you the example of the WTO, where only the Commission speaks on behalf of the whole of the European Union. That is because trade policy, the common commercial policy, is an exclusive power of the European Union. And it's listed among those exclusive powers. But when you look at other areas of international affairs, you have to be aware that most of these areas are not exclusive powers, but so-called shared powers. And what does that mean? It means the European Union has a competence, but the member states continue also to have a competence. And so the big uh, challenge is, in most of the areas you have so-called shared competences, so the big question is who represents Europe? Is it the Commission? Is it the member states? The, the rotating council presidency and so on. It's an, as of yet, unresolved area. It's one of the big gaps, if you uh, wish, of the Lisbon Treaty, that they haven't really solved this. And this is currently already leading to a lot of problems that sometimes, I think, give a very wrong and very bad uh, image to Europe. I refer to one particular uh, conference in June of this year in Stockholm. You had the big international conference to kick off negotiations for a worldwide mercury treaty ban uh, regulation, strict regulation on mercury. No, there was a, a strong fight within the European Union and in the very end uh, the, the fight was so bitter that at that international conference in Stockholm the European Commission simply declared, look, we come here, we can state you what the Union legislation in that area is, but we haven't received a mandate to negotiate. 
So, nous voilà. I mean, they are there, and we are simply exposing our internal divisions at the international level. It's been it's a very bitter fight, but precisely because member states said, no, this is shared competence. We want to be part of the negotiation team for that new global treaty. The Commission say, no, 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 no. Many areas of things legislated at union level, so we, the Commission, should be the negotiator. There's a lot of division about this area. Uh, of, of shared competence. But there are some other interesting things, for instance, the solidarity clause, which was unheard of before, but now in case there is a terrorist attack or an armed aggression upon one single EU member state or a nature or man-made disaster, there is a legal binding solidarity clause. A bit like we have in NATO, as you know, the famous Article 5 clause in case of an armed attack, we now have a similar thing at European Union level. That also shows that you are growing up as a kind of cohesive actor in which there is indeed an obligation for all member states to have solidarity and mutual support vis-a-vis -vis each other in case of very strong emergencies. I come now to the ambiguities in the whole scheme of external representation. I mentioned to you we have created this new function of high representative. Fine. But that's just a part of the story. And I'll, again, this is my legal background, but I, I give you a couple of quotes from the treaty to illustrate the ambiguities in the external representation. I mentioned Mr. Van Rompuy as the new permanent president of the European Council. What does the treaty say? The TEU is the Treaty on European Union. The president of the European Council, at his level, and in that capacity, ensures the external representation of the Union on issues concerning its common foreign and security policy. It's a rather remarkable close because it says, yeah, this person is indeed at the top political level, level of heads of states and government. He's going to do the external representation. He will speak on behalf of the European Union, but only on matters of CFSP, common foreign and security policy. Because then you have another article that says, with the exception of CFSP, the European Commission shall ensure the Union's external representation. Mr. Barroso, as I said, President of the European Commission, usually likes to travel around the world and take center stage in the UN and other places in order to say we are the European Union. He speaks on behalf of the European Union. The division of tasks in the Lisbon Treaty has been, you know, the common foreign and security policy is for the President of the European Council. Mr. Barroso speaks in all other areas of policy making. Hmm? There's maybe some log logic to that, but in any event, it adds to the complexity of the new thing. And then we have the high representative, Lady Ashton, who the treaty says she represents the Union for CFSP. Wait, but you said that about Mr. Van Rompa. Yes, at his level and in that capacity. You understand? At the level of heads of state and government, it's Mr. Van Rompuy. At the level of ministers, say, foreign affairs ministries, it's Lady Ashton. So but it already shows a, a couple of uh, uh, complexities. And then at the external posts, where we previously had basically the rotating presidency of, us, of an individual country doing all the kind of diplomatic intercourse in third countries at international organizations. Now the treaty says union delegations in third countries and at international organizations shall represent the union. So at the UN in New York or in Geneva or in the capitals, the bilateral uh, diplomatic uh, relations capitals in the world, it's now not anymore a member state, the one having the six monthly uh, presidency that should do the demarches. It is the union delegation. And the union now has its own ambassadors, EU ambassadors. A little side note again, ambassador, um, as you all know, is of course a function that is traditionally attached to a nation state. You're representing a state. It's part of the diplomatic, say, scheme, international diplomatic law, and so on. You're representing at the highest possible level a nation state. The EU is also calling its own heads of missions ambassadors. The interesting thing is if that you read the letters of accreditation that they sent to those third countries, they will speak about Mr. X with all his devotion will assure the external representation and he will carry the courtesy title of ambassador. 
So it's not a real ambassador, it's courtesy. It's a good question, but they, they're, used, they're calling themselves ambassadors, and increasingly this will also show something in terms, you know, it's a non-state body, the European Union, but they have ambassadors, and they speak up on behalf of these 27 nation blocs, bilaterally, multilaterally. So it's an interesting type of uh, novelty. That's the treaty, and that's already complicated enough. What is the practice? Not the law in the books, but the law in practice. The interesting thing is that in less than one year's time, you see an unfolding practice which is already quite interestingly deviating from the treaty scheme. The best example that you can give there is the G20. The G20, and I think it's one of the great merits of CG to have focused so strongly on the G20 and it's the transformation that it has undergone in the last, uh, especially over the last two, three years. But we see, as you know, that the G20 is composed of those 19 countries plus the European Union. Who represents the European Union at G20 summits? In Toronto, next month, in Seoul, in uh, Korea. The new practice is that, indeed, we are represented both by Mr. Barroso, the President of the European Commission, and by Mr. Van Rompuy, the President of the European Council. Again, I mean, you have to think a little bit from the viewpoint of those other countries that are just sitting there with one single person, knowing that already among the 19 countries sitting in the G20, we have four big European Union member states, France, Italy, Germany, and the United Kingdom, from the old G7, G8. They are already sitting there. They accepted Barroso, president of the European Commission, for already many decades. Um, and now, basically, they've also accepted, I can imagine rather grudgingly, that yet another European high-level personality will join them, Mr. Van Rompuy, who, if you go back and look at the treaty scheme, basically has only something to do with regard to common foreign and security policy. Now, if you know the work of the G20, you know that it's not really about common foreign and security policy. It's about taking steps in the face of the financial and economic crisis and so on. Now, you can imagine that the agenda will be broadening up, as it has done in the past with regard to G7 and G8 meetings. But still, it's remarkable that you, the union is represented there by these two guys together. And I find it remarkable that it has been accepted also by the rest of the G20 uh, membership. Bilateral summits, we also see changes because you have there a disappearance of this old council presidency. The rotating presidency vanishes. And you now see basically those European personalities, Barroso, Varompuy, Lady Ashton, the high representative. I mentioned de Gucht here because uh, Karl de Gucht is the trade commissioner of the European Commission. So you see that um, you have also a set, interesting setup and transformation of the bilateral symmetry of the European Union with the individual member states disappearing and having just a number of EU-based personalities there. We do not know yet how this will like, uh, uh, implement it in all of the other bilateral uh, relations. Because, as I mentioned before, the European Union has quite a lot, I would say too many, so-called strategic partnerships with third countries. They have them with the US, with Canada, with Japan, China, India, Brasilia, Korea. There are regular summits with Pakistan, with Ukraine, and so on. It's, it's ongoing. The EU likes to conclude these so-called strategic partnerships. It's an interesting type of instrument also. It's a little bit, um, I must say, empty in the sense that there are a lot of words and a lot of uh, dialogues and discussions going on, but I'm afraid that the real actorness and the real kind of reciprocity that you can expect in a kind of strategic partnership that that is very often lacking, uh, lagging behind. The European Commission as a treaty negotiator, I've mentioned already the Mercury debacle and all the fights that are going on. Union delegations at international organizations, they are there, but they're currently understaffed. They cannot cope with the job. It's just too much work. Can you imagine the full General Assembly for more than three months in New York that uh, the EU delegation has to manage that and coordinate with all those 27 member state missions? It's just an incredibly difficult job. So I, I just come from New York now. I was there uh, in the beginning of this week. And what have they been doing in practice? The Belgian presidency has kindly and generously offered to support the union delegation in all possible areas. So it's a kind of subsidization, if you want, 
want from the country that is currently holding the presidency. That's a very, uh, I must say, ad hocish type of support structure for six months until the end of this year. In January, Hungary takes over. We'll see what Hungary does. I'm afraid that Hungary will have different kind of attitudes and instincts than the Belgians uh, currently have. What is also interesting is that in the diplomatic practice, now that new union ambassadors are being sent to third countries and international organizations, the accreditation letters are signed together by Mr. Barroso and Mr. Van Rompuy. I mean, you can say, what's that? Just writing an accreditation letter here, yeah, but it is, if you wish, an exercise of a function of head of state. So I, I was always thinking now, Mrs. Ashton, as the foreign policy supremo of the European Union, as the head of this external action service, she will be the one signing all those letters. No, she's appointing, but the actual accreditation letters are signed at the higher political level. So there again, you see this kind of uh, Van Rompuy Barroso tandem doing things together having developed some kind of modus vivendi between each other, but at some stage they will end, I think, in a deep clash, because the institutional positions are basically conflicting. Mr. Barroso has an institution, the European Commission, that has for more than 50 years been the main engine of European integration, that has 23,000 EU officials uh, below it, under it. How many people support staff does Mr. Van Rompuy have? Well, you do away three zeros, 23. So he has a little cabinet. So I mean, there's a, an incredible imbalance between the two, and I'm sure at a certain moment, depending on the personalities and so on, there will be clashes between those functions. I come to the last part, and I'm in the hands of the chair to see uh, when I have to stop or not. But uh, that is what I personally consider to be one of the main um, challenges for the European Union in international affairs. As I said in the beginning of my talk, the Union has a very strong commitment to multilateralism. It works, it wants to work together to deal with common problems, global problems, in particular in the context of the United Nations and all kinds of global organizations, from the G20 to the WTO to the UN and all its specialized agencies, fine. But there is a big problem there. Most of those international organizations are still premised upon nationhood when you want to become a full member. You know, it's, very, it's not very difficult to join the United Nations as a member, but the only thing you need to be is a peace-loving state. Now, that's what the Charter says, eh? the United Nations Charter. You need to be a peace-loving nation. Fine. L rather low threshold, and that's what the UN is about. The UN wants to be a universal organization, quite legitimately. So, I mean, that's why we have 192 member states of the United Nations, all peace-loving states. So the EU could, in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it will qualify for the peace-loving. The problem is it's not a nation, it's not a state. And what does the EU, what kind of status does it have? And can it have at the, European, at, at the United Nations? Well, it currently has a simple observer status. Now, I don't know if you ever visited the big room of the General Assembly in New York which is, you know, it's currently horrible over there because they're restoring the UN and it's, it's full of kind of uh, construction works. But, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a fascinating room and you remember all those speeches by the heads of state at the high level segment. But when you look, uh, you're in the back of the General Assembly, you, you see what it means to be an observer. The governments, well, maximum five delegates per country, will all sit in the front, 1,000 people basically. And the observers will sit on those so-called blue seats in the back of the auditory. Now, those observers, there are many of them. There are 72. And the European Union is one of those 72 observers, next to the International Committee of the Red Cross, next to the Sovereign Order of the Knights of Malta, and so on. It's a pretty modest kind of position, if you wish. They have it already since 1974, in a completely different era. So that's what they currently have, and I, I don't know if you have followed a little bit the events, but um, say a month ago, um, there was the attempt of the European Union to upgrade its position in the General Assembly. They tried to have a resolution adopted by the 
ending 64th General Assembly, to give the EU a so-called enhanced observer status. And that's, that's, if you wish, a little click upwards in the direction of membership rights, because as an enhanced observer, you can speak higher in the list of speakers. At the high-level segment, it would have meant that Mr. Van Rompuy could have spoken up in the part in which the Obamas and Chinese presidents and so on speak. It means that you can really contribute to the debates, that you can really also, I mean, have notes distributed, what have you. A much more active involvement. In a way, that enhanced observer status is already given nowadays to a number of special actors such as the Holy See and the Palestinian delegation. They have this enhanced observer status. The EU tried to obtain this little upgrade from observer to enhanced observer and it failed miserably. It's just nightmarish that there was such a divided vote about it. And all those countries that receive millions of aid and subsidies from the European Union basically voted against it. It was a very severe, traumatizing diplomatic debacle from which they, I, they will take long, I uh, think, months, if not years, to recover fully. Uh, I've written a, a little policy brief about it. You will find it on our website, because indeed it's just so severe. It was such a miserable failure. And I've, having been in New York, I've spoken with many diplomats, and I now see much more clearly why, indeed, it was such a failure. There are lots of things, lessons to be learned uh, for the European Union. But OK, now you see, uh, you, you cannot reach membership status in the UN. Are there international organizations where the EU has reached this more fully grown status of member? Yes, the WTO, where indeed since its foundation in 1995, the EU has a full membership status in parallel with the membership status of the 27 EU member states. Very, very interesting, parallel membership status, which was accepted in the WTO, which was also accepted 20 years ago in one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations, the FAO in Rome. The Food and Agriculture Organization has indeed changed its own constituent treaty to allow not just for membership by states, but also by so-called REOs regional economic integration organizations. It's the RAO clause that when it is inserted in a multilateral treaty or in the basic charter of an international organization allows for an accession by the European Union. The problem is just, you know, there are very few international organizations with such a clause. And if you want to have it accepted, you have to deal with a membership of 190 countries. So by the time you have sufficient ratifications, you may be a few decades ahead. So it's not a very easy thing for the EU to, to grow up and to have a more recognized status in international organization. The problem is the own rules, the basic constituent document of the organization. The problem is also, politically speaking, third countries, I think increasingly, think that, you know, why should we accept this stronger role of the European Union? Yes, why should third countries accept that? I mean, usually in the UN business, uh, you, you don't accept anything unless something is given in return. So the whole question is, of course, well, give and take. And for instance, if we accept the European Union as a kind of enhanced observer, why shouldn't we also bring in the Arab League or the African Union or the Organization for the Islamic Conference and so on to have also an upgrade? So having a bit of an inflated upgrade of various regional organizations would be an interesting type of, type of new element in the construction of, uh, of, of global governance. So, But third countries are not necessarily necessarily applauding this kind of upgrade of the European Union. They very often prefer to see Europe divided, you know, divide and rule. It's a pleasure to see Europeans uh, discussing and, and, and disagreeing with each other in front of the world, uh, which sometimes happens in the UN. And then, remarkably enough, but a very sad fact of life, the own EU member states very often do not like this. You know, can you imagine you're a state, you're a sovereign state, you have your proud international diplomatic network, you're a member of all those wonderful international organizations, and then suddenly the European Union comes up and you have this commission guy who starts speaking on behalf of the entire European Union. It requires a lot of 
call it altruism or modesty or, how should, or discipline to accept that you should not speak up yourself anymore and that it is the Commission representative speaking on behalf of the whole uh, collection of EU member states. So very often it's EU member states themselves who do not really like this. And uh, there are some very interesting declarations attached to the Lisbon Treaty which I think have been uh, drawn have been written by um, British diplomats that basically are saying that with all this new machinery, high representative European diplomatic service and so on, tourist la même chose. They're basically saying, you know, member states continue to have their own diplomatic services, will continue to have their own membership of international organizations, including the United Nations Security Council. And from that quote, Security Council, I, I really think it's, it's clear. This has been written by British diplomats, maybe with some complicity by the French or so. But the permanent members, Europe's permanent members in the Security Council, do also not really like too much the idea of, you know, the long-term change and a European uh, permanent seat in the Security Council and so on and so forth. So there are all kinds of issues here. And I think I mentioned to you already a couple of things, such as the failed bid for the General Assembly. There is a pressing case for the IMF. I mentioned to you the fact that we do have a single currency, but that it is nowhere reflected in the current institutional setup of the IMF, where you still have an executive board with lots of European countries sitting there, like, I mean, of course, France, Germany, they have a permanent uh, type of director in the executive board of the IMF. But you know, Belgium and the Netherlands also have one. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the Belgian director in the IMF, but isn't it a little bit anomalous that now that for 11 years there is no Belgian or Dutch currency anymore, there is a European currency, but that the actual representation of the Eurozone is inexistent? that you only have a kind of very modest observer status of the European Central Bank that may make a statement when it is about the monetary situation of the Eurozone. I think it's, it's untenable and there is now a strong pressure upon the Europeans because you may have heard IMF reform is coming up very soon. It's going to be on the agenda of the meeting in Seoul of the G20. And there is, I think, increasingly a form of call it coalition between the United States in a number of the emerging countries that will, I'm afraid, push very strongly for a diminished role and voice of the Europeans in the IMF. Uh, you may have heard about the uh, U.S.'s uh, objection to the extension of this um, uh, notion, motion that makes it possible to have a 24 members executive board, whereas the IMF's articles of agreement basically only allow for 20 members of executive board. Uh, everybody was thinking, well, that will be extended infinitely. The U.S. this summer has objected to that. So they're going to put lots of pressure upon the Europeans to say, you will have to give in a few seats. My uh, attitude in that respect is, yes, indeed, if you carefully look at many international organizations, most of which have been set up um, not that far after the Second World War, they still provide for a form of structural overrepresentation of European countries. Look alone at the Security Council. You may have seen the, la the latest elections to the Security Council, which I remember were not extremely successful for Canada. Um, but where indeed you will now have, from 1st of January, you will have four EU member states on a Security Council out of 15 countries. Two permanent ones, UK and France, and you have Portugal and Germany who were elected. Now, four out of 15, let's admit that, structurally speaking, that's somewhat overrepresented, yes? I cannot imagine that the rest of the world will continue to just accept that Europeans are so, I would say, overrepresented in countries, and that they typically then will still ask, you know, can we have an extra seat for the European Union around the table? Because they don't like to sacrifice seats. They like to have a second or a third seat, depending on the European personalities that have been given certain um, responsibilities. I think that we have reached a stage in which the European Union, especially now with this new treaty, with all the new apparatus that is being uh, implemented and, uh, uh, and put in place, that one is in need of a bit of a comprehensive strategy to say, what shall we do internationally? 
we have to do a couple of things. We have now the machinery in place, but it cannot be a zero-sum game. The rest of the world will possibly not accept that you will see a stronger role of the European Union at the international scene, but while keeping just a status quo, the involvement of all those individual EU member states. So I, I, I am in favor myself, and we're writing a big paper about that, that we need to restructure, and that we have to, in a certain way, say, look, Maybe we have to decline a little bit the role of individual member states, but that in turn should favor a stronger role of the European Union, this kind of uh, corresponding uh, changes. The problem is you find very little consensus uh, for that among the EU member states yourselves. And so typically what has prevailed until now is pragmatism, incrementalism, muddling through no big grand uh, strategic vision um, rather than a big bang. So I'm not sure whether there will be sufficient political will in Europe to strive for a big bang. And if you strive for it, you'll, be, you'll have to be very, very clever and shrewd as a diplomatic actor to convince the rest of the world to vote uh, for that. I also think we need to marshal resources and do increasingly clever ways of burden sharing between resources at the member state level and at the European Union level. I gave the example of the UN, uh, of the EU delegation at the United Nations. Even with the, um, say, stronger capacity they receive, they have now 12 additional national experts and so on, it will not be enough. One needs to restructure resources and have more fundamentally a form of restructuring of European diplomacy in which part of the resources of those national foreign affairs ministries will be pooled at the level of the EU diplomacy. That's what I would favor. So I'm at the end, no, I mean at the end of my story, thank you very much. powerful actor within the GATT and nowadays in the WTO. Always been in that area what we call an area of exclusive competences, so the European Commission being really effectively the voice, the single voice of Europe in the whole multilateral trade arena. So if you go and visit the WTO in Geneva, you will be astonished to see that there is this whole room with all those delegates and that the 27 delegates of the EU member states will simply sit there and never speak up. An incredible discipline for uh, diplomats, as you can imagine. But the only person that speaks up on behalf of the entire European Union is the Commission representative, is the European Commission. And that, of course, means that they coordinate ex ante their positions and what have you. But you, you do really have there, I think, a rather interesting illustration of the external dimension of European unification, namely the EU acting with one voice on the world stage. But that's in the trade area. We have in the financial area, as I said, we have the euro over the last 11 years. It's been a great success story. It's nowadays already the world's second reserve currency. I think it will continue to uh, grow in importance. As you realize and remember from the beginning of this year, we've gone through a number of turbulent uh, moments. The Greek uh, currency uh, crisis, uh, the Greek uh, uh, crisis and the, the speculations that uh, went together with it. But we have survived. And and I think what is happening right now is that um, the system is deepening and is adjusting to the challenges. There's now an enormous interesting work going on about economic governance and stricter financial budgetary disciplines vis-a-vis uh, -vis national governments, even with, uh, say, a sanction uh, system that is going to be um, uh, implemented. But this is a unique thing, you know, a single currency, a currency without a state. Uh, for in, in international relations terms, uh, a, a currency is really something that is very strongly linked to the notion of a nation state. In Europe, as a kind of, I think, really achievement of this post-World War um, uh, integration process, we have come to the stage that we have a single currency, but without it responding or corresponding to a nation state. It's not linked to a nation state. Look at the euro coins and the euro notes you will not find a head of state on it. Well, on the coins, yes, because there has been a compromise in which the, the, the back side of the coin could still have the national kind. This is an open-ended kind of question, of course. I will not have a an, an definitive type of answer. Not just because it's so broad, but also because the story is unfolding every day. The Lisbon Treaty entered into force on the 1st of December last year, so 
less than a year ago, and it has brought about quite a number of important changes, but many of the institutional ramifications still will have to be felt because lots of the things are still in process of being implemented, and I will tell you about that. But let me start off with, as a kind of introductory question, the question, now, what's really new? Wasn't the European Union already a global actor before this treaty entered into force? Indeed, the European Union has been with us, well, strictly speaking, only since 1993, when the Maastricht Treaty entered into force. But as you know, the European integration process has been far uh, older, and in, in fact started the early 1950s with the setting up of the so-called European Coal and Steel Treaty, the so-called Paris Treaty. So in the, in, in the course of like 60 years of European integration, we have seen a great number of things happening internally in Europe. We have set up um, a common market, later on a single market or inter internal market, but it's basically the same. It's about internal economic integration, free movement of persons, peoples, um, of capital, services, uh, goods, and a customs union, obviously. And on that basis, which we established already in the 1960s, we continued to deepen the integration process with the big kind of uh, next step being the Economic and Monetary Union, the EMU, the single currency, that was introduced uh, 11 years ago, with also the political unification process being very important ever after German reunification, leading to the Maastricht Treaty, where we created a kind of overall umbrella structure for the European integration process, the European Union. And so I'll, I'll speak about the European Union and how it looks like after the Lisbon Treaty um, uh, in a few moments. But let me just first say, already before this new Lisbon Treaty entered into force, the EU was doing a lot of things uh, internationally. Trade, it's actually the world's first trade power. Whether you like to um, acknowledge it or not, it is indeed the biggest trading bloc in the world. 500 million uh, people, lots of, uh, say, exports, imports, always been uh, a very nice of uh, uh, illustrations and you will see indeed uh, it's, it's nice also as a collector's item you have all those euro coins depending on the country you're in even on one of Vatican City nowadays but but the notes as you may uh, recall are all just you know architectural design styles uh, Literally, um, not real places because one didn't want to attach it to any capital or to any real historical site, but it's the styles of European like uh, architectural um, uh, history. And in that sense, it really shows also physically on the notes how detached this is from the, from the symbols of a nation state. Uh, it, it's really something quite remarkable. But I mean, that currency area is becoming more and more important not just internally as a beacon of stability, but also externally. The only problem, and I will come back to it during my talk, is that we haven't yet reached the stage in which there has been this kind of, I would say, external um, consequential step to be taken, namely that within the global financial institutions, we also are replacing the individual member states with a kind of Eurozone uh, representation. If we look at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the EU member states have just continued to act as if they still had their own currency. They're still sitting there, but singly, as individual states. And I think that's an anomaly that we have to repair um, as soon as possible. Development and humanitarian aid. You may not know it, but the EU is the world's biggest donor. 65% of official development aid comes from the EU plus its member states. 65%. Humanitarian aid, more or less uh, similar figures. Security, which for a long time in the European integration process has been a taboo subject because of some rather unhappy um, things that, uh, that, that took place in the, the French Assemblée Nationale in 1954 when the project for a European defense community was basically torpedoed um, over there. But, you know, now, nowadays, after the, especially since the Kosovo intervention of NATO in 1999, we see a real emerging European Union security and even defense policy taking place. There have been uh, more than 26 crisis management operations already in four different continents. I will not say that these are the most bold and ambitious 
these projects, it's definitely not comparable to the UN's. There is no such thing yet, there may be in the future, is a former Belgian uh, Prime Minister, Herman Fein Rumpoy, uh, who is in the middle of the action, as it were. That said, for quite some time now, it has been argued that Europe is much too concerned with its own problems to be able to really focus on global issues. This week we're witnessing essentially the dismantling of much of the foreign policy and defense apparatus of the United Kingdom, what used to be known as the British Empire, uh, will have seen better days. Uh, you cannot dismiss half a million public employees without causing some effect on your capacity to deal with the world, and that is what we are seeing. I mean, this is really something of a remarkable uh, magnitude and, and, and size. I, I haven't seen something like that for a very long time. Um, some say this may be a harbinger of things to come elsewhere in, in Europe. I, for one, am thus especially keen to hear what Professor Waters has to say on the subject of the EU and global governance, which is the way forward, and what we can expect from the EU on some of the critical global challenges facing the international community. Without further ado, I leave with you Professor John Waters. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. <laughs> as I only learned this morning that you have been ambassador in quite important places. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here in CG in Waterloo. It's my very first visit, not just to Waterloo, but also to Canada. And um, uh, I, I, I really feel like uh, this is a beautiful and a wonderful country that we in Belgium could learn a great deal of things about, because we in Belgium have also a little bit our own kind of uh, problems for the moment, political problems, f forming a new government, and so on. And in a country like Canada, there are obviously other types of interesting linguistic uh, arrangements and so on that we, uh, I think, in Europe could, could learn and benefit from. So we, could, we should get to know each other much better. And in any event, for this group, I can already say you will be very welcome if you ever come to Brussels or Leuven. We're only like 15 minutes away from Brussels. And um, I can assure you, Leuven is a great town with lots of nice things to offer to students. We'll talk about the European Union as a global actor after the Lisbon Treaty and um, I mean Good afternoon Welcome to the second International Governor Series lecture of this academic year. We are especially fortunate to have with us none other than Professor John Waters, who holds the Chair in Global Governance at the University of Lorraine in Belgium, who also directs the Center for Global Governance Studies in the Institute for International Law. He is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe and Chairman of the Strategic Advisory Council on International Affairs of the Flemish Government. And practices law at Linklater's in Brussels and is the editor of the International Encyclopedia of Inter Intergovernmental Organizations, has a long list of publications including many books to his record, including one on the United Nations and the European Union. In his spare time he jogs, he tells me. I don't know what spare time he would have. <laughs> uh, here at CG and the Balsili School, we have paid special attention to the role of emerging powers and of course to the G20, which has been one of the, our key policy platforms. But it will be argued that a lot is happening in Europe on the global governance front. And Belgium and the University of Leuven are of course at the very core of that action. Uh, we were talking with Professor Waters uh, last evening and also earlier today uh, about uh, how important it is for students that are interested in issues of global governance and regional governance to actually see it in action as opposed to just read about it in, in books. 
And obviously, uh, the University of Leuven and uh, Belgium is at the very core of uh, the, the EU. And you know, um, for those of you who would be interested in the possibility of spending some time there, uh, actually seeing the uh, famous Eurocrats uh, doing their shenanigans, uh, I think it would be a very uh, good and enlightening uh, experience. Um, to see with Anne, first time what it takes to run to run Europe. Not not an easy task in general terms. Uh, I would say particularly not an easy task these days. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the president of the European Council, uh, not the president of Europe.